Welcome to Rockfish Church. We are so glad to see you here today, whether it's morning or evening or afternoon when you're watching. It's a good time to be hanging out with us. Yes, today, amen. <laughs> and we are at the end of this month, but we are not at the end of the sermon series. However, let's talk about what we're going to see today or he see and hear about today. You know, as a uh, as a Christian, I think a lot of Christians would agree with this that that many people long to go to what we call the Holy Land, to go to Israel, to go to Jerusalem and see some of these some of these places in real life that the Bible talks about. You know, because a lot of times we read the stories, but you know, I, I remember hearing a lot about Disney World, but when I actually went, it was much, much different. You know, there were memories and things and it just solidified things. And I think that what we're gonna be talking about today is is historical evidence of biblical accuracy. In other words, the things that we read about in the Bible, did they really happen? And if they did, are there dents in the dirt that show evidence of that? And you know, I, I shared in one of the earlier shows that as a young man, I wanted to be an archeologist. I was fascinated with dinosaurs and, and history. I still love history. So this series is kind of an opportunity for me to kind of revisit, you know, some of those, some of those archeo early archeological dreams. And it's debatable whether the um, Indiana Jones series had anything to do with that or not? If you check the timeline, okay, it Well, may, we'd have to get a birth date and we, then we'll we look up the movie. Yeah, no. We don't want to do that, but it may or may not okay. have influenced that. <laughs> so, so, so is there archaeological evidence of the existence of key people in the Bible? Key people key in people. the Bible. Yeah. Hmm. What if I told you that there was archaeological evidence? In other words, there was, I call it dents in the dirt. Again, there's, there's remains of the actual existence of 38 Old Testament uh, figures right now that we have, we've not only, wow. you know, so, so a lot of people look and go, well, the, the Bible isn't history. The Bible isn't history. I think we've got to be very, very careful when we hear people make statements and, and they make statements like, well, there is a, there's a general consensus that that just means that a lot of people got together and agreed on something. It doesn't necessarily make that it true. That's true. <laughs> so, so I heard somebody say, we have, we have theologians, we have atheists, thank God for archeologists. You know, because we can actually look at some of those things. I mean, when can, can you go to Mount Sinai and look and see the burnt rock where God came down? Is it that real? Is that is that is that something? Am I just saying that? Is that something that's really that we can really really do? Is there evidence of the flood? Is there evidence of of King Solomon and David and all these folks? And and, and the reason that I'm doing this series, or the reason that we're doing this series, is that all of these evidence. All of these evidences take God out of this, this theological or imaginary kind of capacity and it validates and solidifies the reality of God in his real creation. Right, it's like reading a book and realizing that you're not reading fiction. Yes. You are reading something that's a biography and you're like, this is real. This is this is a this is a story. This is not a flannel graph Jesus, okay? Yeah. yeah it is yeah. a real deal. Exciting yeah. stuff. Yeah. When you open the Bible, and this should be the way that your your heart is wired, when you open the Bible, it reads like nothing else. You can trust it and you can entrust yourself to it. You can't do that to Time magazine. You can't even do that to the to the local newspaper anymore. But think about it. When you read the Bible, it is a different read because it speaks of reality. That's right. And there's some cool information if you are a member of Rockfish Church already on Right Now Media. You can find some really interesting series that talk about going to the Holy Land if you just want to get a two-dimensional eye on it. Kind of cool stuff. Just a plug for that if you need more information, get in contact with the office about it. And it's time for an awesome worship service and an awesome message. And we will be back with you in March. See you later.
charged with making, equipping, and releasing fully committed followers of Jesus Christ. And one of the first acts as we come to be a believer, as we start that journey as a follower, is to be baptized. And I'm going to offer you that opportunity. Maybe you have begun following Christ, or maybe you're going to make that decision today. We want to give you the opportunity to take that next step, which is water baptism. So as we continue to worship, if that's you, please come. There are men to your right that will help you out. We've got everything that you need from blow dryers to towels to dry clothes if you need them, but come if that's you. Okay. 
could sing these songs as I often do. But every song I sing is a word. So I throw my hand. Don't you get shy on me, lift up your song
seated we'll have the ushers come at this time and prepare for the morning offering our opportunity to advance the kingdom one on one so father we just thank you so much you have met our needs you have provided for us and take care of us and love us so good we want to give back to your kingdom so bless our giving in jesus name amen It is so great to see you here, and we have what's brewing for you, so let's take a look. All ladies are invited to the 10 a.m. Ladies Brunch and Bible Study on Saturday, March 2nd at the Rayford site. This is a great time to connect, study the Word of God, and the fruit of joy. Please bring a dish to this potluck-style event. The Rockfish Church reached you began collecting items for their spring supply drive in support of the local pregnancy resource centers on February 11th. Let's make a difference in these babies and mothers' lives by picking up a list of needed supplies at every site foyer and dropping off the items at a designated table. The collection of supplies will continue through March 24th. Have you cleaned out around the house and have good condition, usable items to donate? You can place them in the shed in the side of the Rayford Church location or drop them off at our Rayford or Rockfish Yard Sale Store locations. You'll also want to check out the many varied treasures that come through the stores. Both donations and purchases help support ministries of Rockfish Church. For more info, store hours, and locations, visit rockfishchurch.com. And that is all we have right now, so we will see you all next week. Hello, Rockfish Church. Hello, Rockfish Kids. <laughs> good morning, good morning. Ladies and gentlemen, this is your first time here at Rockfish Church and you have kids with you. You're going to need a sticker to get into our kids' ministry. Why I need that sticker? Because we love our kids so much. We do everything to keep them safe, keep them secure, teach them about Jesus Christ, and then give them back to the correct parents. So we want to make sure the code letter that you have matches the one your child also. Also, at any time during the service, in the back of the screen, in a banner, the same code letter may appear. That means your child needs you. So to do that, go out the double doors to one, the kiosk, print out the sticker, place it nice and high like I do. So it's easy for our lifeguards to see. If you can't print out a sticker, go to the kids' ministry table, register your kids. They'll print out the sticker for you, and then for future services, you will be able to print it out. All of our classes are available, so nursery all the way to fifth grade. You're released to go to your classrooms. Ladies and gentlemen, please, immediately after the service, don't forget to pick up your children. Let's continue to worship. God bless.
Jesus, you are worthy. You deserve it all. We crown you with many crowns. We ask in Jesus' name that you transform our hearts. You are the one who came to rescue us. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Rockfish Church. If it's your first time, um, hopefully we met you on the way in. If not, there's a welcome center on the other side of this wall. We'd love to get to to get to meet you on the way out and um, properly introduce ourselves. Thank you for joining us online, everybody gathering uh, today. Uh, I pray that um, you guys can overlook my voice. I'm, I'm struggling with a little bit of illness this morning, um, and hopefully it won't be too much of a distraction. Uh, and so we can get focused on, on the words to be spoken today. Uh, let's, let's pray over this word before any, we go any further. Father God, we ask you to, to speak to us today, Lord. Uh, take these things that are not even necessarily of um, your origin, uh, not necessarily of, of your written word, Lord, as we ex- examine them today. Let them speak clearly about us being able to have greater confidence in your written word, in, in your son, and in, in everything we, we've learned through reading the Bible, Lord, that we would be able to have greater confidence moving forward. I pray that you would speak for me today, Lord. Use me and open our eyes and, and, and our hearts to, to a greater understanding in receiving this. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, guys. So if you are, again, if, if it's been just a couple weeks um, we've been into this series. We're doing a 12-week sermon series called Armed and Dangerous. In the last three weeks, we spoke about um, different, different pieces of science and how it complements what we see in the Bible. And so this is week four. And we're going to talk about historical evidence uh, for biblical accuracy. And so I apologize because a lot of the stuff I'm going to reference today, I have to read. Um, so there will be a whole, a whole lot of reading and, and it'll be very, very dry. So I apologize. Um, so we're going to cover in this historical um, evidence, we're talking about evidence of the existence of people in the Bible that validate it as history, not merely myth or fable, and evidence of events that took place in the Bible as well. But I want to talk about limitations we encounter when, when trying to rewind time, go back a couple thousand years and look at some things. So the, the amount of records on any one person that was not in a royal position or a senior philosopher or a massively successful commander in, in the military, um, those, those people don't have records. We can't go back and find those people. So that's one of the, one of the things we're competing with when we try and, and validate somebody's existence through historical records. And so the average human being leaves behind no trace except for their children. And so without access to the Bible, we would, we would know just a handful of names 
um, from, from those times, we, we would not know nearly as many names uh, from the Jewish culture if it wasn't for the Bible. And so access to the archaeological evidence, again, for a specific low-ranking person, for example, Jesus, very hard to come by. And another factor we need to consider uh, when we're looking for archaeological evidence of Jesus and other significant biblical characters is that there is currently a civilization living atop the previous civilization. And so while we would have more success in, in digging up all that used to exist, there are people and a, and a, and a, a population and their construction, their, their infrastructure living on top of that right now. So it's very hard to go back and find some of the things we would want to look for. But I want to talk about framing the question properly. And so the accusers or non-believers in Jesus Christ, they would say, and asking you or, or me, they would say, why so little evidence for this person you say is the Savior? And I would say, we need, to, we need to understand that they're framing that question with the presupposition that he can't be their Savior and he can't be ours. But the real question we should ask is, why so much evidence for one lowly man who ruled no one, won no wars, owned nothing, and had no children to continue his legacy? Why is there a multitude of writings about his existence, his teachings, his miracles, even his death and his resurrection? And so we know his name. We know where he lived. We know where he spent his time. We knew, we knew the routes he took from place to place. We knew his entire lineage and the names of his friends. We know his deeds. So the question again is why so much evidence for one man's existence? So in comparison, there's an estimated 100,000 to 150,000 people that were crucified under the Roman Empire within a little over 500 years. And so very few of those names are actually known. Also, Jesus was an extremely common name 2,000 years ago. We only know of a few, and only one stands out. The estimated world population in 1 AD was anywhere from 200 million to 330 million. We know dozens of names from that time period and of which over 90% of those people lived in poverty or below the poverty line. And so again, they, they would have been person of low status or one we would, they'd be non-remarkable, right? Unremarkable. And so we wouldn't have any evidence of them by name. And I would remind you, that in a courtroom testimony of two or three witnesses is enough to right, rightfully convict the accused. And if that's enough evidence for conviction of a crime, how much more convincing of someone's existence do we have available for us when we, when we talk about Jesus? But I do want to spend a few minutes before we get to talking about Jesus specifically. I want to spend a few minutes giving credence to the Old Testament because this lends to our faith as well. All right, so... As we read through the Old Testament, we see hundreds of years of record keeping in God's written word. When we compare that to the records from adversarial people groups, we see congruency in the record keeping, pointing to validation at some level that these stories and events are being captured and credited to real people in real time or near real time. And so there is actual archeological evidence for five pharaohs mentioned within um, within the Bible, for one king of Moab, for five different kings of Aram Damascus. We have evidence for eight kings and one governor from the northern kingdom of Israel and the southern kingdom of Judah, only a, a total of 14 characters. Some of them were kings, some high priests, some scribes, and some lower officials. In Assyria, we find archaeological evidence for five kings and one prince. In Babylonia, evidence for three kings and four officers. And lastly, in Persia, we find archaeological evidence for five kings and one governor. So when we, when we look at that, that archaeological evidence we've been able to verify for all those people, this brings validation at a certain level to old 12, 12 Old Testament books, right? So we can't know exactly how accurate they are. But we, we see validation from external sources that these were real people and the people they were interacting with at the, in the, within the Jewish culture and community, that there, there is validation to those stories. And as they're being written in those rough time frames, we would, there'd be plenty of ability to contest the writing of a few men and say, you know what, that's not how that happened. That's, that's not what happened. But instead, 
The Jewish people, they, they accept the Old Testament as the record keeping for their time, for their people, for their population, and all that occurred. And while these things were being written in near real time in a lot of events, they're being captured after the fact or by scribes and then later inducted into their, their, their books of history. They had access to their elders in their community that would be able to say, that's, that's not how that worked, worked out at all. In fact, all these things are, are lies and is being manipulated. That's not what's occurring. It's being validated and approved by their culture year after year. And so the, the masses of the Jewish people embrace and hold to these writings is true. The cultural acceptance of these events is evidence in itself. And on this note, it is the current existence of the Jewish faith, the Jewish religion, that gives us some of our strongest credence uh, to our faith as Christians. Right? So we have an opposing faith to ours that believes in the same God, the same path to creation, the same flood we talked about just a few weeks ago, the same prophecies foretold in the Old Testament about the New Testament. The only disagreement is whether Jesus is the Messiah. And so there's no need to condemn the Jews for for their lack of faith in Jesus, but again, to appreciate that there are people outside our faith that validate everything leading up until the moment of Jesus and their historical documents and our documents that, that lay the groundwork for our faith. And so while the framework for our faith was constructed in the Old Testament, is validated by this other religion. So our foundation obviously has to be focused on, on Jesus himself and Jesus being the Christ. So I want to look at some evidence we can examine for him. But again, with him being a lowly person and not, us not having actual archaeological evidence for him through belongings and, and possessions and, and maybe his house was found, all those kind of things, we have to go to writings about him And so, as a reminder, we we do observe the Old Testament portion of the Bible as official Jewish historical records. So again, a whole other population, a whole other faith believing that those are historical records leading up until this point. It is their primary documentation. But outside of biblical records, we've got access to other things that the the Jewish people were writing after Jesus uh, came and lived and died and was crucified. So... In those, in those writings, we see Flavius Josephus, who is not a professing Christian. He wrote Jewish Antiquities. And according to Bart Ehrman, which is somebody living in these days, he, he is an, an atheist, well known for his scholarly evaluation of the New Testament. He says Flavius is far and away our best source of information about first century Palestine. The fact that he calls it Palestine kind of tells you where, where his priorities are. right? But for him to say that, they, that is somebody who today, who is again, not for Jesus, not for the Christian faith. He says, this guy, as we review his writings, he is far and away our best source of information about that first century that Jesus lived in. And Flavius, uh, Flavius he, he wrote his 20 volume history of the Jewish people around 93 AD. So about 60 years after Jesus' death. So Flavius was a reputable Jew in his day, and he knew people who had heard and seen Jesus. So he is, he's, he is talking to people who had firsthand accounts of their interaction with Jesus. When writing about the unlawful execution of James, he refers to him as brother of Jesus, who is called Messiah. And this is a scholarly reconstruction of one of his writings, stripped of any Christian embellishment. It says, now around this time, Jesus lived Jesus, a wise man, for he was a worker of amazing deeds and was a teacher of people who gladly accept the truth. He won over many Jews and many Greeks. Pilate, when he heard him, accused by the leading men among us, condemned him to the cross. But those who had first, <clears throat> excuse me, but those who had first loved him did not cease doing so. To this day, the tribe of Christians named after him has not disappeared. There are also other writings uh, by Flavius um, that are more explicit about the nature of Jesus' miracles, life, and status as the Christ that are available. 
Scholars believe there are a number of Talmudic writings referring to Jesus, and many of those writings are said to have used code words to describe Jesus, such as Balaam or Ben Stada or a certain one. And so for the purposes of being extremely uh, fair and, and um, we don't, we don't want to take things that may be out of context, uh, we will be very conservative and limit our examination to passages referring to Jesus in a more direct way. One quote being, Jesus practiced magic and led Israel astray. Another says, our rabbis have taught that Jesus had five disciples. I'm not going to butcher those names right now. They taught that, or they, <clears throat> they brought Matai to trial. He said, but must Matai be killed? For it is written, when Matai, <clears throat> when Matai shall I come and appear before God? He's quoting Psalm 92 too right there. They said to him, yes, Matai must be killed. For it is written, when Matai, he dies, his name will perish. And there's similar quotes captured for the death of the other four disciples that they acknowledge as being his disciples, that, that they're quoting biblical references to, to during their death and their execution. Um, they're being killed for their faith in that moment. And possibly the most famous of the Talmudic passages we could reference for Jesus' existence is he was taught on the day before the Passover, they hanged Jesus. A herald went before him for 40 days proclaiming he will be stoned because he practiced magic and enticed Israel to go astray. Let anyone who knows anything in his favor come forward and plead for him. But nothing was found in his favor, and they hanged him on the day before the Passover. There's this tradition, this Toledot Yeshu, is a medieval Jewish retelling of the life of Jesus. It is completely anti-Christian. There are many versions of these retellings as part of the transmitted and, and oral and written tradition of the Jews, we can presume their original place in antiquity. And so it contains a determined effort to explain away the miracles of Jesus and to deny the virgin birth. In doing so, they use a story of rape to explain Jesus' conception, validating that he came from one woman, not from a woman and a man. He is portrayed as a disrespectful young man that needed to flee to Upper Galilee out of shame. He is accused of being clever enough to learn the ineffable name of God that would grant him power to do what he wanted. He then claimed to be the Messiah and people demanded signs. He used his knowledge of God's name to perform miracles. He rounded up hundreds of young men to be his followers and worship him. He, later, <clears throat> he was later betrayed by Judas bound to a pillar, given vinegar to drink, worn a crown of thorns. His followers freed him in a scuffle and he fled until the eve of Passover, riding on a donkey, arrested, put to death in the sixth hour. He was hanged until 4 p.m. A gardener robbed his grave and he was later found in a garden. So they're, they're not saying he didn't exist that the things that occurred didn't appear to occur in the way they did. They just gave other reasons for, for why all those claims we have in the New Testament are false. Pliny the Younger wrote a letter to Oprah, uh, Roman Emperor Trajan describing the lifestyles of, of early Christians. <clears throat> in describing us, he said, they were in the habit of meeting on a certain day fixed before it was light, when they sang in alternate verses a hymn to Christ as to God, giving validation to the fact that, that we didn't somehow over time decide, oh, you know what, we need to elevate Jesus to being a godlike figure or giving him that, that credibility of being a deity, that, that even back in those immediate days, they were acknowledging him, acknowledging him to be God himself and, and bound themselves by a solemn oath not to sin after it was their custom to separate and then resemble to partake of food, but food of an ordinary and innocent kind. So the imperial house historian and analyst, Suetonius, he describes the treatment of Christians under Emperor Claudius because the Jews at Rome caused constant disturbances at the instigation of Christus. Christus sorry. Claudius expelled them from Rome this expulsion took place in 49 AD, so less than roughly 20 years after the death of Christ. In another writing, Suetonius 
wrote about the, the fire that destroyed Rome in 64 AD and Nero blaming and punishing the Christians. So we know that Jesus had an immediate impact on his followers. They were committed to their belief and Jesus was their God and withstood the torment and punishment of the Roman Empire. And Jesus was a curious and immediate impact on his followers, empowering them to die courageously for what they knew to be true. And that's witnessing the willingness to die for the belief because these were people who met Jesus, who were healed by Jesus, who heard his words and came into direct contact with him. There was no reason for them to have to doubt in any way. They weren't trying to reach back 2,000 years into, into words they had read about somebody they'd never met. They met him and their faith was so strong and so real they were willing to die at the hands of the Roman Empire again and again. And Celsus, who was a harsh antagonist of Christianity, and his antagonistic claims, uh, claims of the gospel, he unintentionally affirms and reinforces the biblical authors and their content. His writing is extensive, and he alludes to 80 different biblical quotes confirming their early appearance in history. He also admits the miracles of Jesus were generally believed in the early second century. So even a even hundred years after Jesus, his his miracles are still being generally believed by the people. And uh, so I've had to edit this part for language because there's just certain things I won't say when talking about Jesus. But th remember, this guy is extremely antagonistic. So Jesus had come from a village in Judea and was the son of a poor Jewess who gained her living by the work of her own hands. His mother had been turned out of the doors by her husband, who was a carpenter by trade, on being convicted of adultery. Being thus driven away by her husband and wandering about in disgrace, she gave birth to Jesus. Jesus, on account of his poverty, was hired, <clears throat> hired out to go to Egypt. While there, he acquired a certain magical powers, which Egyptians pride themselves in possessing. He returned home and highly elated at possessing these powers, and on the strength of them, gave himself out to be a god. So again, people who don't like Jesus don't like Christians, don't want anything to do with the faith. They're not saying he didn't exist. They're giving validation to his existence, his life, the miracles, even down to the wearing of thorns. This stuff is acknowledged time and time again by people who are actual historians and actual, the antithesis of the Christians. They don't take away from, they add to. In talking about his crucifixion, we've seen a little bit of reference to that so far, but it, we continue. And, and so just in case um, some, some of you guys haven't read your Bibles and gotten to this part yet, I'll, I'll read through a couple verses so we can see them being alluded to later. So Mark 15, verses 33 through 35, we see it says, At noon, darkness came over the whole land in, until three in the afternoon. And at three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lemma sebaktani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? In Matthew 27, 45 through 46, from noon until three in the afternoon, darkness came over all the land. About three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lemma sebaktani, again, meaning, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And right after that, in Matthew 27, 51 through 52, we see at that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook, the rocks split, and the tombs broke open. The bodies of many holy people who had died were raised to life. And so we see an acknowledgement of an earthquake and darkness for three hours. Now that darkness for three hours has only been explained through the, our understanding of an eclipse. And if anyone, I mean, we, hey, we got an eclipse coming in about five, six weeks now. It lasts for minutes. And yet there was something about this event that caused a total darkness to come over that region of the world for roughly three hours. And so as we go through Roman records, Roman Senator <coughs> Tacitus is, is known for his his analysis and examination of historical documents and is among most trusted of ancient historians. He's a senator under Emperor Vespasian and is also the proconsul of Asia. When writing about Christians being punished under Nero, he states, Nero fastened the guilt and inflicted the most exquisite tortures 
on a class hated for their abominations called Christians by the populace. Christus, from whom the name... <clears throat> from whom the name had its origin, suffered the extreme penalty during the reign of Tiberius at the hands of one of the procurators, Pontius Pilate. And a most mischievous superstition thus checked for the, for the moment again broke out, not only in Judea, but, but even in Rome. This mischievous superstition they're referring, he's referring to is, hey, these, these people that, that were that were raised up in, the, in, in seeing Jesus perform these miracles and in hearing his teachings, they behaved in certain ways and, and you could easily identify who they were. It, it was checked for a moment. People kind of backed off. Hey, like they just killed him. Let's rethink this. I said, no, it, it resurged not only in Judea, but also in Rome. In other records, we have Thallus, who is possibly the earliest secular writer to mention Jesus. And he is so ancient, his actual writings don't exist anymore, but we're able to turn to Julius Africanus, who quotes him around 170 AD. Quoting, quoting Thallus, um, <clears throat> the attempt to explain away the darkness occurring at Jesus' crucifixion, on the whole world there pressed a most fearful darkness and the rocks were rent by an earthquake, and many places in Judea and other districts were thrown down. This darkness, Thallus, on the third book, in the third book of his history, calls as appears to be without reason an eclipse of the sun. Again, for three hours. We have Marabar <coughs> Serapian, a a Syrian philosopher, he attempts to encourage his son by comparing the life and persecution of Jesus, who he refers to as the wise king, with that of philosophers who were persecuted for their ideas. He writes, again, he's writing to his son. He said, what benefit did the Athenians obtain by putting Socrates to death? Famine and plague came among, uh, upon them as judgment for their crime, or the people of Samos for burning Pythagoras. In one moment, their country was covered with sand, or the Jews, by murdering their wise king, after their kingdom was abolished, God rightly avenged these men. The wise king lived on in his teachings he enacted. Phlegon, also mentioned by Julius Africanus, who wrote a chronicle of history around 140 AD. In this history, Phlegon also mentions the, the darkness surrounding the crucifixion in an effort to explain it. He records that at the time of Tiberius Caesar, at full noon, there was a full eclipse of the sun from the sixth to the ninth hour. Phlegon, who also described Jesus as a, this is, this is huge. So he also ascribes Jesus to having knowledge of future events and then also testifies that the result corresponded to his pre predictions. So not only that, that Jesus claimed to know what was coming, but when he said what was coming actually came to pass. This is validated through this man. There's a Greek satirist, Lucian of Samosata, spoke and wrote sarcastically of Christ and Christians, but never referred to them as fictional characters. Instead, he affirmed they were real people. He said, the Christians, you know, worship a man to this day, the distinguished personage who introduced their, their novel rites and was crucified on that account. You see, these misguided creatures start with a general conviction that they are immortal for all time, which explains the contempt of death and voluntary self-devotion, which are so common among them. And then it impressed on them by their original lawgiver that they are all brothers. And from the moment they are converted and deny the gods of Greece and worship the crucified sage, and will live after his laws. All this they take quite on faith, with the result that they despise all worldly goods alike, regarding them as merely common property. So these are just some of the records we're able to come across. And I apologize if you, if you came here today and you, you wanted to hear Bible and you wanted to hear gospel, we will have people up here to pray for you. If you want to hear the message of salvation, we will be meeting with you right up here after uh, we conclude in prayer. Okay, but we, we, we have to be able to explore extra biblical texts which lend credence to believing that the word of God is 
true. It does hold up. We don't have to move on, on blind faith and just trust that somebody else knew what they were talking about. We can go to those who, who weren't as emphatic in believing our God and, and having met our God, and they would trust that this was a real man who walked the earth and who healed people. They can call it what they want. They can say he practiced magic, and he went to Egypt and got it, and all those things. We need to be able to trust there are sources outside that lend to the truth spoken in God's word. And so that's what we're exploring. I think, I think we'll, we'll go to more biblical texts in the next few weeks here, but we really wanted to, really want you to leave this month knowing that you don't have to choose science or God right? That you don't have to look at the Bible and say, it, is it validated by the things of this world? Does it, does it stand alone? It doesn't just stand alone. It stands above. That's what the power of God's written word does. It's every time we examine it against the truths of this world, whether we're talking the laws of physics, the, the flood that we examined a few weeks ago, history, as more time goes on, as more, more tests occur, as people are more honest about their information, we realize the Bible stands above all. It brings it all together. We don't have to choose one or the other. And we should have confidence that we're not walking around having to choose between the two. And so I want to ask you, let's, let's stand, we'll pray, we'll, we'll let you guys get out of here. Father God, we, we thank you for your written word and it's, it's perfection. All, all that it gives us, all that it lends to us. Lord, we, we also thank you for the things that are outside your word that allow us to have greater confidence, Lord, that, that we would be able to stand a little taller, hold our head a little higher in, in knowing that our belief does not separate us from the world. Not, not in, in the way you teach us, Lord, but in, in, in reality. We're able to hold to everything that we've been taught and everything that, that you've created and everything you've shown us. I pray right now, Lord, that everybody hearing these words would have greater confidence in the truth of your word and that it's not in opposition to your creation, Lord, but it, it shows us the validity. It shows us your design. It, it shows us your perfect plan that we have that greater confidence. Lord, I pray that everybody hearing these words would be blessed by that confidence. There'd be a greater peace within us and we would not fear the things of the world when somebody comes forward and says there's an accusation against your word. Lord, that we would, we would have, again, that confidence that they don't have the ability to tear down your word. They don't have the ability to cause us to doubt your word because we know it's been examined for so long and it still stands tall. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.
Thank you.